And uh, just a few slides now on these, uh, the, the mystery of the divine animals. There is a whole category so vast in, in the history of art, the history especially of ancient art, that um, it has its own classification. And the classification is simply called the Lady and the Beast, the Great Mother and her, um, um, and her divine animals. Uh, this is one from uh, what is today Syria, and it's um, uh, an image of the great goddess of that place whose name I have uh, right now uh, forgotten, probably um, Asher, uh, Ashereth, but I'm not certain. Anyway, uh, a goddess of the what we call the Middle East, and she is dancing between her two sacred... Um, they're like mountain goats. And this, this, of course, tells you that this particular animal, and that's a very deserty, mountainy area in that, uh, in that part of the world, as you know, uh, undoubtedly would have been animals sacred to those people at that particular time. This would be equivalent uh, to the time of uh, early uh, Judaism in terms of imagery. And I think, as I say, it's Asherah. So the great mother as Lady of the Beasts, dancing between her two divine animals. Those of you who know people who go to England and find out what coat of arms you know, their family can be traced back to, um, the origin of that as a central image with the uh, supported by animals on either side is, um, can be traced back to these early images of uh, the Great Mother dancing between her two divine animals. Now, uh, and I've talked about divine Artemis as um, from ancient times. Now, Artemis as uh, a character, so to speak, in, uh, in uh, Greek mythology, um, it's an old, it's, she's an ancient, ancient spirit. The word we use for her, Artemis, or, and then of course when it came to Rome, Diana, it's the same, it's the same character, so to speak, the same energy, but her name has changed through time. Artemis is the name that we know her in, of course, classical Greek. Uh, we don't know her names back into the dimmest history, except that we know that she was one of the earliest manifestation of the Great Mother. So this, this whole theme of Lady and the Beasts is one of the oldest categories in the history of art that we have. And one of the great thrills of visiting the museums all over um, well, for, in my case, the West. I haven't traveled um, beyond the. Um, I've only the far as, the furthest I've traveled is to um, is to Turkey, the Middle East. Um, I mean, the Holy Land, and of course Egypt. Um, but I suspect that uh, if if you if you were able to go visit to all the great museums of the world, you would find this theme of Lady of the Beasts everywhere. This is one of the earliest uh, images we have uh, in Greek in the Greek style, in the Greek art of Artemis. This is um, a huge vessel. It stands about this high. And it's uh, down in the bowels of the, um, uh, uh, of, uh, the museum, the Louvre in Paris. And is uh, so huge that it's this uh, a kind of space about this size is dedicated to it because this is one of the great masterpieces that has survived from the what's called the archaic period which is a period um, about 8, 7, 600 uh, BC. You can imagine that uh, something this large made of clay, the fact that it survived at all is, is, a, is a huge, it's a miracle in itself. The sands of time have crushed most ceramic things, of course, back down into their original earth form. So here is Divine Artemis. She's when she's called as, as Lady of the Beasts. It's not only beasts, land beasts, but it's all of the birds and all of the creatures who swim in the sea. Uh, Greek, Greece, of course, being a land that a peninsula that uh, is is on three sides of the sea, and um, both sides and then at, at, at the bottom, um, and attached to the mainland only in its northern area. Uh, is, is a huge, from the beginning, seafaring land. And so we have Artemis as bird, here are her wings, as bee, this is the face of a bee, uh, her womb, uh, her body, uh, filled with the watery sea, filled with fishes, 
and then the beasts on the land, wild beasts, but also domesticated beasts, and all of the birds of the air, especially water birds. You'll see that the whole, this little design up here, uh, are a series of, uh, of, of, of ducks and, 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 and water birds uh, making up this design that moves all the way around. Now this, this is, I say, this thing is huge. It comes all the way down here. There are also lots and lots of snakes because snakes are identified um, with both land and sea. Uh, this, of course, is the ancient symbol for the sun. Here is the sacred spiral attached to this uh, wild animal. Although this is a static, cruciform-like design, in fact, the, the, sun, the sun energy spinning around um, uh, gives a lot of uh, energy to it, plus her, her arms moving out as, um, as, as bird. So it's close yeah. to five feet high? It's, uh, I would say, yes, it's at least five feet high. Okay. This is another of these uh, manuscripts from India I'm so uh, very fond of. Instead of two women uh, coming away now to spend the day out in the garden, in this, in this uh, case uh, it's, it's a quasi-wilderness, but she's come out alone and she's come out to commune with this uh, cobra. And we know it's the wilderness, although the, the trees look a little bit uh, formal. Uh, we have a, a, a sort of hillocks implying we're out in the country. Uh, a deer back here, uh, various birds. This little deer has come forward to see what's happening. And we have a little river, uh, but also enough of a wildness so that we have a tiger here who's going to have uh, a duck for lunch. <laughs> and the woman is here communicating with her um, uh, with her familiar, this serpent, this cobra. And I had already been uh, using this slide in my presentations for a number of years when I happened <coughs> to see on, uh, on PBS one of these um, documentaries on, on public television an extraordinary film uh, filmed in a village in India. And um, a woman, it began with uh, a woman being brought out sort of ritually by inhabitants of the, the perhaps the, the chieftains of the village, whatever. And she was uh, surrounded by good-sized baskets, baskets maybe about two or three feet off the ground. And each basket was held by a young man, like a teenager, like an older boy, a teenage boy. And she was sitting in a circle of these uh, of these little these boys holding these baskets, and uh, one by one the basket was lifted, and uh, or the top of the basket was lifted, and a cobra, uh, 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 you know, climbed out of the basket, and moved toward her, and she was able, when it got fairly near her body, about like what you see here was able to start this fantastic dance with the cobra, which was like this, and a kind of humming, and sounds coming from her. And the uh, serpent at some point started flicking its, its tongue to listen to her. And at a certain point, the, uh, the serpent was so filled with her trance-like movement that she was able to reach forward and touch that serpent's tongue with her own. It was one of the most electrifying things I've ever seen in my life. And I suspect that this is what we are looking at here. We are looking at this, this ability of women to enter into this trance with, uh, with this divine animal and to the point where there is the physical contact. It was quite extraordinary. This is a very elderly woman, by the way. She looked like she was, I mean, she was very tiny, very withered, and it's like she'd, you just had a feeling she'd been doing this all of her life, that this is what she did. And you also understood, and, and, and of course, around this circle of the, of the men with the uh, baskets, each with a cobra in it, there were the villagers watching. And you had a feeling that what she was doing she was doing for the good of the gathered people, that somehow her communication with this divine spirit, this creature of the uh, below, 
uh, you, you, you just feel was for the benefit of the entire village. And I don't know if you've seen that uh, up each, each of these uh, tree bowls, um, there is a snake twined. And these snakes are watching what's happening. A beautiful image. And again, there's a whole classification of um, in art history, and much, much of this is uh, primitive uh, tribal um, imagery, um, simply called um, animals and people. Because all through, from the beginning of time, from most ancient, whatever, things that we have back into the dimmest history, um, we, we find uh, images like this of, of human beings, children, men, women, it doesn't matter. I mean, it, 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 it has nothing to do with, with uh, you know, male or female energy or adult energy or child energy. But we have these fabulous images of people with their animals. And very often, the animal is a dog. Rarely is the animal a cat, for instance. It's very, very often a dog. And uh, look at the intimacy. And now this, look at the simplicity of this piece. There, any of you could, in an afternoon, make a simple, simple clay piece like this. And the intimacy, the simplicity and the intimacy of this, uh, of this person, this child, you can, any way you want to read it, in relationship to this, uh, to this small dog. Um, the re our relationship with animals is so important, is so ancient, is so intrinsic to our human nature that we must always, in whatever way we can, celebrate it. That image I just showed you, I could show you a hundred of those. I could have you ooing and eyeing for an hour just looking at that one kind of image. And I say this to you just, so if, if that interested you, you know, as I say, there are hundreds and hundreds of these images. If you ever have a chance to go to Mexico City, to that great museum, there are thousands of images like that in that one museum. Uh, and the, each one different, each one, you know, different animals, uh, several children together with one animal, beautiful compositions. Um, and you just know that they were made, you know, sitting on the ground, handling the clay on the ground. Possibly that was even a, a, a made by the person, uh, was a self-portrait, you know, with his or her, her animal. Now, in terms of the West, um, and I'm speaking now only about the West, because obviously if we move from place to place where we enter, in a, enter into an entirely different system of an sacred animals, for instance, you know, the, the, the elephant is not sacred uh, to the Americas, whereas, let's say, the jaguar is, uh, the buffalo is. So that sacred animals uh, are indigenous to the geography. Um, the two sacred, primordial sacred animals in our Western culture, the origins of our Western culture, are the, first of all, the bird, and secondly, the snake. And when I say first and second, I don't mean that one is more important than the other. I'm talking about manifestation. From the beginning of time, the bird has been understood as one of the great embodiments of the Great Mother. Uh, and hence, we have in this land and in my own heart, in my own mythology, this superiority some, somehow, this hierarchy of the Crow Mother being uh, greater than, and as I say, among the, the peoples here, she is considered uh, by some peoples, the native peoples, as the mother of all the Kachinas, the mother of all of the other spirits. The great bird is articulated all through the arts that we, we think of now as the, the Western civilization, the ancient Western civilization. They are articulated in many, many different ways, but in Egypt, um, because we have so much remaining in situ, in, um, in the land of Egypt, you can actually be in the temples uh, that have been there for three, four, five thousand years with and be able to see an image like this. Um, so that although much of the great treasures of, uh, of uh, Egypt were hauled back into um, the nations of Europe during the uh, uh, 1800s, 
uh, still when you visit Egypt, uh, there is uh, such a wealth of imagery, it's, it's simply overwhelming. So this is divine mut, M-U-T, the divine, uh, the divine sacred vulture. Now we've talked about vulture when we talked about the vulture images at Shatal Huyuk. The understanding that the great mother is the great, the great bird who gives birth to all that is in, these, in, the, in this fascinating concept of the world egg, but then takes all that is any, all flesh, whether it's the flesh of uh, animal life or the flesh, of, the flesh of, of, of grains, all that exists returns to her body. And the great um, birds that keep the earth clean, the, the great uh, birds that scavenge, and also the animals that scavenge, um, that will eat death. This whole principle, this mysterious principle of eating corruption and turning it into flesh is the earliest manifestation of resurrection. The understanding that there is life after death, that, left, that death is transformed into life. And this was a huge mystery to ancient peoples. Well, of course, it's no less a mystery to us, except that that was in the beginning, it's the aboriginal understanding that there is life after death, that what we think of as dead can be brought back to life uh, in the living flesh of, um, of the great uh, vulture mother. So let's look at a few of these uh, bird images. Now the, the, the bird images change from culture to culture, from century to century. This is a very early Minoan piece, early Greek style. And you can see the kind of the stylization of the, it's like a, not exactly like a woman's figure, but anyway, the, the, the understanding of a head and a, and a body and arms and, and breasts. Um, and a vertical column Im implying the rest of the body. Um, these, this is a small, these, li these are little votive statues anywhere from three inches to about six or eight inches tall. And uh, when a person was buried, whether they were, uh, whether they were buried in the earth or uh, strapped and sent out to sea, um, as far as I know, uh, there wasn't, um, there, there were not cremations in Greece, but there may have been cremations. Uh, I've, I've never read about cremations in Greece. Anyway, the, uh, the point is, how is the body prepared for, uh, for, for death? And um, so that when the body is, let's say, entombed in one of the great vases I just talked about, or actually interred in the ground, uh, the body is, laid, is, laid, is overlaid with many of these votive statues like this, the understanding that the bird, the great bird mother, is a symbol of resurrection. And uh, so here she is, the kind of you know staring, you know little little dots like uh, like birds' eyes are, and all of these wavy lines not only mean flight, but they also mean when we come to the serpent, with this, see the same kind of wavy lines in the serpents. It means um, the electrifying energy of uh, everlasting life. Um, this represents. Um, a baby bird. I myself have never been able to figure this out, so don't ask me to show you the head of this baby bird. But this represents, again, at her left, um, at her left breast, just like the, uh, in, in the future, the, uh, the, the sacred Madonnas nursing the child at the left breast. Uh, this is another, this is an extraordinary one. This is, again, the sacred uh, female trinity of um, the great goddess as uh, grandmother bird, mother bird, and baby bird in relationship to uh, the, the human imagery. It's the only one I've ever seen, and it's in the, uh, a private museum, a private collection in Athens. It's, one of the, it's utterly astonishing. It's, it's gorgeous. It's about, uh, about nine or 10 inches tall. And the other, uh, scarcely less important, because the two are always uh, understood at the same time, um, along with the bird is the divine serpent. 
And why uh, of all of these animals uh, are these two the the most uh, the most set aside as, as animals um, more important or more highly elevated than other animals? Because of this mystery of the egg. These are, of course, the two um, creatures who lay the eggs of creation, who lay the eggs uh, that symbolize uh, the world order, which crack open and, of course, bring forth new life. This slide is reversed, I'm sorry to say. Uh, this is the left breast, except that I've turned the slide around. Um, just to give you an idea of scale, uh, this is about two inches high. So if you can imagine, this is about the size of your thumb. Uh, it's a tiny, tiny little piece, but look at the splendid articulation. And the, uh, any time you get a kind of wadge, like a crown, rising up like this, uh, it's in relationship to the polar opposite. So that this, the, the, the serpent mother, who is a creature of the below, at the same time carries the energy of the above in her divinity. And the little, uh, the little child, the, the snake baby, out of its shell, uh, now uh, nursing from her, which of course isn't the way it is at all. I mean, serpents, baby snakes do not nurse from their mother. But again, this overlay of, um, of, of, of the, the human articulation of these great spiritual um, manifestations. The beautiful articulation of the pubic triangle. So again, the anthropomorphization, however to say, I, I left a syllable out of that word, the anthropomorphizing of the animal kingdom. Crete especially, I'm sure you know that Crete is that uh, sort of horizontal island, so to speak, a huge island um, off the southern coast of, uh, of, um, of Greece. Uh, had, <laughs> had an entirely separate uh, uh, level of civilization, a very, very advanced level of civilization compared to mainland Greece. It rose, rose and died, rose and died, rose and died three times. And uh, these were all, the, the, the fall of this culture uh, was not a military invasion. Um, in fact, there was, uh, there was virtually none of that for <coughs> thousands and thousands of years. Uh, but because of earthquakes, which caused tidal waves. And the tidal waves um, destroyed uh, the first level of culture in, in about 5000 BC, and then another level in about 3500 BC, and then yet another level, uh, like about 1500 BC. And after that, there was an invasion from the mainland um, um, that, that in fact people call the Mycenaean invasion that then overlaid the Minoan. But for thousands of years, one of the, uh, the greatest areas of um, highly civilized cultural advance took place on this island that we now call Crete. And the supreme uh, goddess, the supreme divinity um, uh, during all of this time was the divine uh, snake goddess. And here is one of her priestesses. And of course, snake handling would have been very much a part of, uh, of her ritual. This is an extraordinarily beautiful piece. It's carved in ivory. And I think you can see the beaten gold sort of um, places of articulation. And she's wearing uh, these bracelets, which are also uh, the, the winding of the, uh, of the serpents. So these would have been handled and danced with just as the Navajo people handle and dance with them today in, uh, in New Mexico. The clothing, uh, which was a tightly fitted waist um, and that ended uh, right under, a girdle that ended right underneath the breasts and pushed the breasts forward, was typical of all of the, uh, the, the dress that the women wore uh, during this time um, in Crete. And another one, a little bit different. She has a leopard on her head. And the divine dog got um, a beautiful, uh, this is a mask that a, a, a funerary priest would have uh, used during the um, 
during the embalming of a body. These holes are where he sat, of course his head was here, and these are the holes through which the priests officiated at the, um, at the embalming of, uh, of a person. So here is, in fact, the dog mask that, uh, that I was introduced to as a child, uh, as a Halloween mask, which has been a constant in my life, um, well, all of my life. And of course, uh, the great uh, jackal-headed uh, god Anubis is, uh, um, is everywhere. It's one of the most dominant images uh, in all of Egyptian art. And the horses, the uh, divine horses, uh, we find all through ancient art of the Mediterranean. This is one of those, you see that this is, this is actually the lid of, uh, of a container about this high, and the containers are about this size, so this would be a large lid with these horses. Some of them are smaller. Uh, some of them are, are, are small, and in, in which case they contain the cremated ashes of, uh, of a human being. Sometimes the, they're, if they're larger, it's because they are filled with sand, and the dead person is put inside, and then the pot is filled with sand. It's a different kind of uh, internment. But uh, no matter what the size of the container, whether it's ashes or, in fact, uh, a full human body that's been wrapped uh, in, sort of wrapped in a in a fetal position before it was put in these larger uh, containers, there are always four black horses on the lid. And they are the guardians of that threshold. They make sure that the, the body, so to speak, is left undisturbed. Uh, so that uh, burial in these urns uh, was very, very common in the, uh, in the Mediterranean societies. And although you see hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these in museums, it's like they're all the same, but they're all different. Um, I mean, you, you can be in a room, and there's nothing in the room, but just one after another of these, and yet they're all different. So that they, they, they were not, what I'm saying is they weren't, they weren't made in moles. I mean, a, a craftsperson actually you know, made each one. Each one is really uh, uh, articulated um, most beautifully. And they're always black with the, uh, with the decoration uh, around the neck area. Very, very beautiful horses. And divine Epona. Uh, we've talked about uh, Persephone a number of times in the course of our time together. Uh, the Celtic goddess um, in, the, uh, in the islands, the, uh, what we think of today as, as uh, England and uh, Scotland and Wales, the equivalent to uh, Persephone is Epona. And she is the horse goddess. And like Persephone rising at the vernal equinox, Epona rises on her white horse at Beltane, which is May 1st. So the night, the, the eve of Beltane, April 31st, uh, uh, we, we have through time among the Celtic people, uh, they celebrate their four turnings of the year uh, are interrelated with the solar, the solar uh, system. So that it, the, the four turnings of the solar year, of course, are uh, low solstice, high solstice, and the two equinoxes. In the Beltane calendar, the uh, sacred turnings are February 1st, May 1st, August 1st, and November 1st. And if you celebrate, um, if you celebrate all feasts, you, you celebrate one of these turnings of the year. Um, in the course of the calendar year, um, you can celebrate them. Um, well, it's eight, eight celebrations. And the celebration for Beltane uh, was probably one of the most uh, exciting ones because, of course, by then, the seeding had happened, the earth, the earth was beginning, the, the plants were beginning to rise, and so on. And it's understood that she rises from the underworld on, on a white horse. The Beltane horse is a white horse. And that like Persephone uh, watching over the growth of the growing season, so does Epona watch over the growth of the season in the uh, Celtic world. And like, um, like Persephone uh, going down at the autumnal equinox, 
um, she goes down, she rides her white horse down into the underworld for August 1st at the end of the growing season. She have like an apple in her hand? The world. The world. Mm. Ah. Lots and lots of, uh, uh, this, this image of the goddesses carrying the sphere represents the, the wholeness of creation, that she is the mother of the wholeness of creation. And that's why you get the sphere coming into, uh, into the, the Catholic Church. Uh, you very often images of Mary show her, show her holding a sphere. It's again one of these artifacts going back through time associated with the wholeness of uh, the feminine energy that they are the mothers of all that is. And the great horse at Uffington, uh, a village in the Chalk Downs in southern England. If you've ever, um, some of you I'm sure visited England, perhaps you visited this. And this is at the very top of the hill, so that what you're looking at has been photographed from, from a plane above it. So that when you're there, you approach it from down here. Whenever I go, and I've been any number of times, you if, and I sit, I sit in the eye, the horse's eye to meditate. And when you're sitting in this eye, you're sitting in a circle about like this. And I'm telling you this just to give you an idea of the scale of this great horse. So that when you're sitting here, you can't see, you can only see like about this, because this falls away at a distance. You, of course, can walk the entire, um, the entire um, landscape of, of, of the great horse's body. It, it manifests because these are the chalk downs, which means that the grass, which grows to about 15 inches, is scraped away. And when it's scraped away, you have to imagine that this is all grass. Uh, when it's scraped away, the, the chalk underneath the grass is revealed. And there are a number of these uh, chalk horses uh, in other parts of England, but this is the oldest one and uh, considered the oldest and the most powerful one. And she's simply called the Great Mare of Uffington. Yes, sir? It, it never, the grass never grows back? So yes, they have to, do, ritually they do this every year. I mean, that the grass grows back uh, like fuzz, and then it gets higher and higher, and, and at that point they, they, and this is a, this particular village of Uffington lays claim to, to doing this. This is something they do as their own identity for generation unto generation. Going way back? Going way, way back. Yes, this is Stone Age. So it's very, very old. Yes, well, it, you, yes, yes, uh, it's not etched so much, it's just uncovered. It's not that they dig down into the chalk, and when you're there, the chalk is lying everywhere. I mean, I went in the studio this, yesterday, I, I, I could have, I, last time I was there, I brought home, well, in fact, I brought home a bag full, I've given most of it away now, but I keep like a handful for the energy on my west altar. Uh, because that, I, you might remember that my west altar is my horse altar, and you saw if you noticed it, you, I have this image of the Great Horse of Uffington. This is one of my most important um, pilgrimage places. I, even if I go to England, um, I'll be there teaching there in the spring of 2004. And even if I go no place else, after I finish teaching, I will go just to be with this horse. It's a very, very powerful energy. And of course, when you're here, the landscape uh, all around you is simply gorgeous. It's just little villages and all green, and uh, you're well away from the, the huge highways. And so if you ever have a chance to visit this, uh, this horse, I, I highly recommend it. There aren't, you know, there, it's, it's not like you have to be there you know, on Wednesday at 10 o'clock or anything like that. It's, it's, she's always there. You can imagine the people who have, uh, since the Stone Age, walked up this hill uh, to feed her. And when you do, and when you when you there, you will see people leave offerings uh, around her head, around her mouth, to feed her. And um, my divine blue baboons, and I will uh, this afternoon uh, when we gather, I will tell you um, of one of my final stories. I want to leave with you, and um, it's about the mystery of the baboon. 
for the time being, I will just say to you that the blue baboon is one of the holiest divine animals in Egypt and associated not only with the moon, but also with the rising sun. Uh, the, the blue baboon is a manifestation of wisdom. Baboon is associated with Tote, the uh, ibis god of uh, wisdom, but also with the rising sun because in the primordial uh, Nile Valley, which would have been wild, wild, thick, thick uh, um, jungle vegetation, the packs of baboons uh, were the first to greet the first hint of the rising sun every morning. So they are therefore symbolic of the rising sun, therefore of resurrection. And these blue baboons, when you visit Egypt and go into these tombs, uh, you will always find an area, uh, a whole wall, at some place in the tomb, representing uh, or with the presence of the blue baboons. This particular image is called the Baboons in the Lake of Fire. Now I know this doesn't look fiery to you, but that's the name of the, the image. And it's one of the judgment halls. Uh, there are 12 from the time the, uh, after a person dies and the Ba and the Ka have left the body but, then, but yet remain near the body, the dead body, the dead body stays behind but the journey to paradise, so to speak, uh, instead of paradise, it's called the Hall of Judgment, um, you pass through 12 chambers where the soul is little by little investigated. Has this person led the right life? Has this person uh, been good to uh, his or her family, has this person on through these 12 judgments and finally the soul is judged worthy to stand before divine Osiris and behind Osiris stand the divine sisters uh, Isis and Nephthys, the goddess of light and the goddess of darkness and Osiris is the same, is the same uh, is, is the uh, thousands of years prior to the Christ figure is the resurrected uh, Christ figure, uh, the, the Lord of life and death. Uh, remember we talked about that, uh, that, that so much of the liturgy and the language of the Osirian mystery came right into the, oh, the, uh, the New Testament. And another uh, image of uh, the baboon, always male, always seated and the uh, the genitals lie in this uh, uh, in this hugely gentle relax like lying over the earth in a very beautiful way the hands on the knees uh, this little piece here would have held a large disc representing the full moon so the baboon is the god of the moon do you remember that story, that song when you were in child the baboon dancing by the light of the moon you see how old these images are? It's like we can still s s teach the songs to our children. I mean, the understanding of the, the moon baboon goes all the way back to ancient Egypt. And another powerful divine animal from uh, our world, from uh, Middle America, this is Mayan. This is um, the goddess um, of infinity of uh, everlastingness and um, her consort, her divine rabbit. So this is another civilization um, which in, who in fact look at the full moon and understand the imagery they see in the moon as the rabbit running in the moon. This is the goddess of infinity, of, um, of time outside time. And her name is Ishel, I-X-C-H-E-L. She's one of the most powerful goddesses of uh, 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 Central America. And her divine hair. Don't you love this? Look at this little. And you see his hand over here around her shoulder? And here is her hand around his shoulder. 